he used to bake bread and sell it in order to earn money to buy a unicycle. I think we all could agree that that's one of the most Brooklyn things we've ever heard, but he's not from Brooklyn. So everyone, please welcome Jonathan. All right. It's, uh, it's awesome to be here, be here for the last slot of the day. Too bad we can't be there in person, but this is, this is how these things go. So today I want to tell you a story about a project that we've been working on. It's a project that involves the R package, as Jared mentioned, and a bit more than the R package, too. And I'm sure that you're all wondering, what kind of story is this? Is this going to be any good? And all I can say is, I had a lot of fun. I had a blast working on this project. So I hope that you enjoy hearing about it. Before we get started in the story, I need to give a shout out to my collaborator and colleague, John Harmon. He was really the brains behind this whole operation. So yeah, none of this would have been possible without John every step of the way. All right, our story begins about a year before the pandemic in those happy, innocent days, shortly after Google had released its BERT language model. And we were working on translating or implementing BERT in R because it had been released in Python. Now, this is not a story about BERT, but just to give a little bit of context and background, I want to say a few words about what BERT is. You can understand BERT best as a, as a model that produces dynamic word vectors. So it produces representations of words that depend on the context that that instance of the word appeared in. For example, Consider these two sentences, which are both answers to the question of why didn't the chicken cross the road? These two sentences are the same except for the very last word. The chicken didn't cross the road because it was too tired or because it was too wide. Now that last word, that changes the context of these sentences enough that the meanings of some of these other words change. So if it is too tired, then it is probably the chicken. But if it is too wide, then it is probably the road. And you can see below here, I've plotted uh, the, the word vectors for some of the words in these sentences. And when it was too tired, you see um, the, the vectors for chicken and road and it are right there. And when it is too wide, you see the vectors for chicken and it and road. And between these two sentences, it, chicken and road don't change very much, but the vector for it changes quite a lot. And it's closer to chicken when it's tired, and it's closer to road when it's too wide. So just as a really brief introduction to what BERT is and what it can do, it's pretty cool, is these context-dependent word vectors. And so we wanted to be able to do this sort of thing in R. And so we were digging through the code of the, the BERT repository that was released in Python. And I came, as I was digging through the tokenization part of the code, and tokens were mentioned in the, in the previous talk, so we'll talk about that a little bit. As I was digging through the tokenization part of the code, I came upon a, a comment in the documentation that really got my attention. But before I can show you what that comment is, or why it was so intriguing, we need to take another brief detour and talk about what tokenization is, just to make sure we're all on the same page here. So briefly, tokenization in natural language processing is taking the input text, and we're, we're generally dealing with text in this context, taking the input text and turning it into a sequence of uh, definite pieces, which we'll call tokens. And the most obvious way to tokenize text, at least in English, is to divide it into words. For example, suppose I have the text, I have clumsy figures, where I intentionally put a typo in that last, in that last word. Uh, if I break this into words, it would be, I have clumsy figures. Now, most of the models that we're going to be dealing with have a specific set of recognized tokens they know about. So that's like a, a token vocabulary. And if a word is found in that vocabulary, OK, then it's a token. We recognize it. If a word like figures is not found, then it's just, let's say, unknown or something. So the, the tokenization of this sentence might be, you know, I have clumsy unknown, if we have a fixed vocabulary. Uh, 
And generally, of course, if we have a vocabulary, then the tokens from the perspective of the model are just represented by their index in the vocabulary, like their, their numeric ID. Now, you can imagine there's going to be a bit of difficulty if you think about language, because the number of possible words is enormous. You know, there are hundreds of thousands of English words, or order of a million English words, not including typos like figurers. And if you had a token vocabulary of a million tokens, that would just be completely infeasible for a lot of uh, current language models. So you have to have, you have to pick and choose, have a smaller a token vocabulary than the number of possible words. And no matter how big your, your vocabulary actually is, there's always going to be some words that you will come across, whether because of typos or new words or whatever, that are not in your vocabulary. So there's these out of vocabulary words, and we have to decide how to deal with them. We, we could just deal with them by ignoring them and saying, I don't know what this word is, the unknown token there. The way BERT deals with out of vocabulary words is it uses the word piece tokenization algorithm. What that basically does is if any word that it comes across is not found in the token vocabulary, it just breaks it into pieces that are found in the token vocabulary. So it would tokenize fig fignerers as fignerers. And this is not a completely crazy thing to do. Remember, what BERT does is it's context sensitive. So when you have a bunch of tokens that are next to each other in the sentence, like it's not unreasonable to break a word into, into pieces because uh, the tokens can influence each other even if they're, if they're separated like that. So just to point out, you see this, this hash hash here. We'll be seeing a lot of that in this talk. This is just a convention uh, in the word piece algorithm. That hash hash means that this particular token is a fragment. It doesn't occur as a standalone token in any input text. It's the result of breaking this word up into pieces. So it, 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 it makes a distinct token from uh, the, the token without it. And it's just a, a clue to humans that these words, that these tokens all went together. OK, so I was just learning all of that about word piece. And I was looking in the documentation for word piece invert. And I came across this, this comment. In particular, uh, I saw this example here. Said uh, if you if the input say this tokenizer is the word unaffable, then the output would be unaffable. And my first reaction was, well, that's pretty cool. Look, not only did it it, it broke this word up, you know, tokenized into these pieces, but so the pieces are kind of meaningful here. You know, the, the un prefix is pulled off, and the able suffix is pulled off. Like this is. Yeah, this is a pretty smart tokenizer. So, you know, I went ahead and implemented this tokenizer in R, and I, I ran it with the input unaffable. You know, expecting to get this nice breakdown unaffable. But what I got was slightly different from what I had advertised. And I looked at that like hmm, those those pieces aren't particularly meaningful at all. Una fa bo. Did I make a mistake with the tokenizer? Did I introduce a bug somewhere? But then I went back, looked at that documentation. You know, word piece is cool, but it, it's not really a very smart algorithm after all. All it does is a greedy longest match first. So it looks at a word. If it's not in the token vocabulary, it just starts peeling off pieces, the longest pieces it can starting at the beginning until it gets to the end of the, of the word. And so in this case, una got peeled off because it's longer than un. OK, so word piece doesn't generally break words into meaningful pieces. It's just kind of you know, a random process in some ways. And to illustrate what can happen with this, I channeled my inner high schooler and produced this abomination of a sentence. And I'm not going to insult you by reading the sentence out loud, but it contains lots of composite words, lots of different pieces, lots of, there's, there's a lot of separate morphemes in these words where morphemes are the, the unit of meaning in words. 
And these are rare enough words that these are not in the token vocabulary. So a lot of these are out of vocabulary uh, for word piece. And I ran this to the word piece tokenizer and it turned into an even bigger abomination. You know, there is, if you look at that breakdown of the words here, there are very few tokens there that have any intrinsic meaning to them that are you know, related to, to, to the particular words in question. And when they are like overseas here is, is a misleading uh, sense of meaning because it's, it comes from the word overseas. And, Okay, so this planted the idea in our minds. Well, wouldn't it be better if we had a tokenizer that did break words into meaningful pieces? I mean, BERT's doing pretty well. BERT's a pretty awesome model. But wouldn't it be even better if its tokenizer was a bit smarter? And you know, there are aesthetic reasons for wanting it, as I, as I illustrated in the previous slide. It's, it's kind of feels nice when we're just broken along uh, meaningful lines. But there are some reasons to believe that a, a meaningful tokenization would be advantageous in training these language models. For example, if you have really uncommon words in your, in your text input, like consider the word unsatisfyingness. That's a pretty uncommon word. You may never have even come across that word so far in your life. It's, it's a word, but barely. It occurs in the Google Books corpus, but hardly at all. And yet you know exactly what that word means because you know what all the morphemes in that word mean, unsatisfyingness. So in the same kind of way, if a language model encounters a really uncommon word that it's seen rarely or not at all in its training, if that word can be tokenized into more meaningful pieces that are much more common and for which we do have good representations of the meaning, then we have a much better chance that our model does something reasonable with that combination of morphemes because it knows the meaning of each piece or has representation of the meaning of each piece. And so the combination will retain some of that meaning. So this is a particularly important when you're working in more specialized domains, like a scientific or technical domains, where you do encounter a lot of uncommon words and uh, there are meaningful pieces in those words. Even for common words, there is some potential benefit to breaking those words apart into pieces along morphemic lines or peeling off suffixes, prefixes, and inflections. So within the morpheme piece token vocabulary, there's about a dozen different tokens that relate to some variation on the word open. If open, opens, opened, opening. Each of these is in the token vocabulary as its own token. Similarly for words like close, or almost any word you can think of, there's lots of small variations on that word. What this means is that the a lot of the tokens in the word piece token vocabulary are used up for the same word. We have to have lots of tokens for the same basic concept and the model has to learn that concept for these tokens uh, or separately. We could save a lot of tokens uh, if we could break apart these words along meaningful lines. So if we could peel off inflections or prefixes, as I was saying, then we could cover the same set of words with much fewer tokens. And this would leave us more space in our limited vocabulary for a greater variety of base words. Like we could have more unique words in our vocabulary if we didn't have to use so many tokens, just covering different variations on these common words too. So you know, there are uh, a couple different reasons that we might like to, to have a morpheme-based tokenizer. And I just wanna say, we're not the only ones that have been thinking along these lines. There's been a number of papers over the years that are looking at tokenization specifically with BERT or WordPiece and considering how it could be better if it did morpheme-based uh, breakup. So we had this idea a while back and every now and then over the last year and a half, we'd say, Oh yeah, remember that thing? We should do it. That, that would be really useful. But 
we, you know, why didn't we do it or sooner? Why didn't we do it sooner? Because even though it's kind of the idea behind this tokenization is rather simple, you know, it turns out to be kind of tricky to actually do this. How are we going to break apart rule, break apart words along meaningful lines? Are we going to write an algorithm that has a lot of rules for just breaking apart words? Like that sounds really hard. There's lots of special cases. There's lots of exceptions and different spellings. Like, and even then, you've only covered English, right? Or whatever language you're working in. So that seems like a, you know, a very impractical approach. The only other approach we could think of is if there's basically a lookup table. If I want to tokenize a word along into its morphemes, I should have a, a big table that I look up that word in, and I find the breakdown and return that. Now that's also hard because there are lots of words. If you think again about how many different variations there are open or closed, like there are hundreds of thousands of words in the English language and we don't have time to write that, to make that lookup table ourselves. Yeah, so we, you know, we sat on this idea for quite a while because uh, yeah, it is tricky. You know, it's, it's not obvious how we can do this with the limited time that we have. <clears throat> so thinking about this a bit more, what we really want to find is you know, a group of people who care about words enough that they are going to willingly spend their own free time entering morphological information about words into publicly available uh, databases. And yes, yes, uh, I see you, Wiktionary. Wiktionary turns out to be almost exactly what we need. So look at this. If I look up the word unsurprisingly in Wiktionary, look right there in the etymology section, it tells me that's, that's formed from unsurprising plus the suffix the. And I, I keep going, unsurprising is un surprising and surprising. I, I put all these together and I find that I have the breakdown for unsurprisingly right here. If I, if I use the hash hash notation just to make it look more like word piece, I get something like this. All right, so this is exactly what we're looking for, right? We want to find out how words break down along these morphemic lines. Now it's not every case in Wiktionary is as uh, easy as this example makes it look. But for the most part, Wiktionary has the data we're looking for. It's not complete. There's a lot of gaps in it still. You know, it's, always, it's going to be continuing work in progress. But Wiktionary is a treasure trove of morphemic data here. And you know, honestly, the, once we have that, the rest of the, you know, the story almost just writes itself. What we do is we, we break words apart by recursively looking them up in Wiktionary. And look up the word, look at its pieces, and keep doing that until we don't get any more break parts. So we, you know, we hit the wait the API over and over, or actually uh, process a dump file, so we don't have to hit the API too many times. We do that for every word in Wiktionary. Now we're working in English, just to kind of, you know, I I, I heard that last talk. Yes, we're working in English because that's the language that that we speak. But what's nice about this process is Wiktionary has a lot of what other language information too. So the process that we are piloting here could in principle be used in other languages if that were relevant. And other languages, there's some other languages that are much heavier, uh, more morphemic than English, yes. So this could be even more crucial for those languages. So once we have the lookup table, once we've generated that lookup table for all the English words in the dictionary, we also have all the tokens that came out of that process and we can select uh, an optimal set of those to include in our token vocabulary. Now word piece, as token vocabulary is around 30,000, that's the size of the vocabulary. So let's just take about 30,000 tokens and of the, of the best, the most common tokens and use those as our token vocabulary. And then we'll keep the subset of the lookup that is covered by that vocabulary. So which words get processed into our token vocabulary? Now in practice, we find that if I have a 30,000 token vocabulary, that will cover about over 300,000 words, which is 
comparable to the number of words and the largest print dictionaries that you can get. So that's, that's nothing to sneeze at. It's a pretty sizable list of words right there that we have a lookup for now. For, for a relatively modest sized token vocabulary. And then there's always going to be some words that are not in the vocabulary, not in the lookup table, so we still have to process those somehow. So we'll just let those words fall back on the word piece algorithm. Actually, we'll modify the word piece algorithm a little bit so it can also include prefixes like we have now. And instead of just doing the greedy first algorithm from the beginning, we'll also do it from the end of the word, go both ways, and pick the, the best breakdown. So we, we modified the word piece algorithm slightly as our fallback, but it's, it's basically word piece. Once we put all these pieces together, we can rewrite the function, and there we have it. We can tokenize text using our morphine piece tokenizer. So take some text in, and you break it up along morphine lines. Let's look at a, a few detail, a few examples of this, so you can kind of see how it works. I took a couple of sentences from technical articles or journals. So tokenization is the process of demarcating and possibly classifying sections of a string of input characters. I tokenized that using word piece and morphine piece. And you can see the differences there. There's, there's a few words that they tokenize differently. I want to highlight in particular the word demarcating. Word piece doesn't know what to do with that word. It's not in the vocabulary. So it just breaks it up into relatively meaningless pieces. Dem, are caving. Whereas morphine piece, it finds that word in its lookup table, and so it tokenizes it as demarcate. Thing. Now, that's kind of one of the key words in this sentence, and word piece obscures it completely, whereas morphine piece, by being sensitive to this, uh, preserves the meaning of that word, or at least breaks it into tokens that likely have, have meaning. Here's another example. A morpheme is the smallest meaningful lexical item in a language. Word piece. The morpheme piece, again, there's a few differences between them, but because morpheme piece has a more efficient token vocabulary for reasons that I mentioned, it has room in its, its token vocabulary for the word morpheme, whereas word piece doesn't. And so in word piece, morpheme gets broken up to three pieces, morpheme, whereas morpheme is a, is a complete token in morpheme piece. One more example, just because one of the things I really enjoyed about this project was finding obscure, unusual words. I, I learned so much about so many things doing this. Uh, the word quasi hemi demi semi quaver is actually a real word. My kids really enjoy saying this word now. And morphine piece, it breaks it up in those meaningful pieces quasi, emi, demi, semi quaver. I'll let you guys guess at what this word means if you don't already know. Just to close the loop here, that abomination, the sentence that I constructed earlier, is still an abomination, but at least with morphine piece, which is the bottom there, it's at least a meaningful abomination. And you can see how the, the morphine piece breaks it into meaningful tokens. You can at least parse what, that, what each word means there. And so, so what's next? What are the next steps in this project for us? Uh, as, as Jared just mentioned, uh, we actually got the Morphin Piece package accepted to Crayon just this morning. So that step is already done. We have the package on Crayon. But this is really more than an R package. We want this tokenization algorithm to be accessible to everybody, no matter what language you use. So one of our next steps is to get this uh, algorithm implemented in Python as well, so that it can be used. Because what we really want to do, what we really should do, is test our hypothesis, which we really haven't done yet. We want to see if this tokenization makes a difference for training language models. It makes a difference in performance on downstream tasks. So one of our big next steps is to actually test this, pre-train a model, like a BERT-like model, using a morphine piece tokenization and compare that to the results using a word piece tokenization and see if there's any tasks that this is this better on. Uh, if anyone is interested in collaborating, we are open to partnerships for this particular project because the resources for this will start to get significant. But that, that is the story that I have for you. Uh, as I said, I had a whole lot of fun working on this, and it's not over yet, and I hope you enjoy hearing about it. Thanks. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Morphine piece sounds like it's actually going to be a big leap forward. That sounds really amazing. Um, and, you know, you want to port this to multiple languages. It sounds like something Wes McKinney has talked about a lot. So I hope you've written this in like something like C++ and you can just put a, a R or Python wrap around this um, or, or you can head that way.